Six months worth to uh, six months of time to apply those techniques. So if we've got less time, sometimes far less time, as Penny was talking to us about uh, when she gave us that BBC lecture. Um, what kind of um, oh, the other thing I remember. It may be that you feel that there's lots of notes here, obviously, and there's going to be more. And it might be you might be drowning in the fact in the sea of what do I revise? What should I be looking at? Okay. Some people will say, oh, I'm looking at what I'm going through on the slides, and that's a good example. The thing you ought to do, the way that you ought to think about this is, I'm going to, pre I'm going to be providing you some notes um, in a few weeks, hopefully before Easter, which tells you the sections that I think are critically important and those that I think are less important, or at least uh, give context and background. Um, but what you ought to do for all of these chapters is at the end you'll see the self-assessment questions. Before we have reading a chapter, after this lecture, you might just want to go through those self-assessment questions. If you can do the self-assessment questions, you're good to go, pretty much. Yeah? You pretty much know, you must know what's in there. So that's the way to focus down into the kind of things that I'm expecting you to understand. But we'll be giving you some kind of uh, um, ideas about the sort of, um, work, about the sort of um, stuff that's important to your experience, or that's just to give context. For instance, the methodologies, um, we talked about software engineering methodologies we talked about last week, um, such as waterfall, etc. That's just to give context to user, the user experience part. Okay, so that you'll know those terms when you come to meet them for people who are, uh, you know, talking to managers and managing them about waterfall as far as But we'll, you'll be getting a handout based on, uh, based on that. Um, there's been a change to the exam. Uh, did you all see that on the blog or the website, hopefully? Anyway, there is a change to the exam, so instead of it being, as I said at the start, two hours and a quarter, it's going to be one hour thirty minutes, um, with ten multiple choice questions at the start, representing one mark each, and then a choice of two longer questions. So you get two longer questions, you need to answer one, um, which gives a total of twenty marks. That one question is divided into a number of parts, so we've got book work, Two questions, two marks each. Discussion and example, one question at six marks. Um, application of technique, that's four marks, one question. And then explanation and original thought, that's one question and six marks, given a total of 20 for each of those questions. So you pick one. There's no, in this course, I use, I have a question bank and a random number generator picks the questions. So there is no 
Um, there's no point in just revising, say, um, one section and thinking there'll be a multiple, there'll be a, you know, one of these long type questions that's worth 20 marks is going to get you, uh, just revising one section is going to get you 20 marks, it's not, because they're spread throughout, okay? So therefore it could be any of those, any of those um, questions could represent, could be part of any of the topics that we're discussing, okay? Okay, let's get on. Any questions before we go on? Yes? Will there be sample papers published? Um, yes. No, well, there may be. It depends how many people decide to give me a kicking about it. Um, generally, the kind of questions that you'd be expecting are in the front, are in your notes <coughs> for the uh, slides. Um, the kind of questions you'd be thinking about are, part, are like the self assessment questions <coughs> that run through every topic. Um, and then there's some other ones which are more difficult, like the original, the original choice, uh, original uh, thought, which, I'm, which are actually not taught as part of, directly taught as part of this. So like about 40, 40 frameworks, you know, information you've got from say Zen and the Psychomotors, or some other experience you've had, that kind of thing. But it won't be tested. Zen and the Psychomotors won't be tested directly, obviously. So if I get lots of people giving me a kicking because they don't think you've got enough, then yeah, I suppose I'll have no choice. But well, it's more work for me, so I'm probably not likely to bother with us. I love people even more. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> Any more questions? Right, so, we've got six, we had six months before. We've got six weeks now, or even less, oftentimes, for trying to elicit information from users. So, tell me, um, what kind of things, what kind of techniques do you think you thought we'd get going on this? Do you think you could use? read any of these notes or you just have them in your head somewhere? Yes? Interview people. Interview people, that's good. Yep, yes. Still getting a bit of observation. You can do some kind of ca some observation that's in a more abridged form, that's true, yeah. Any more? Any more? Yes. Come on. Questionnaires. questionnaires, yes, you can do questionnaires, yeah. Although questionnaires do presume, because they're structured, they presume you already know quite a lot because you're trying to ask questions in a structured format. So normally questionnaires are good for um, quantitative kind of data coming back to you. But the problem with them is that you kind of have to know what the questions you're asking and the hypotheses you've got, otherwise it's difficult. Yeah? Yes? Can iteration be uh, done on every sort of two weeks for your so sort of three iterations? First, first two weeks you just get basic information, then you do the evaluation. And go back uh, and get more information. So, yeah, in the wrong way, if you've, got time, right if you've got time to do that in the in the um, in the schedule, but we'll we'll see soon that in real life you often don't get those iterations. It'd be nice if we did. But I mean, you could integrate it as part of say an agile scrum or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, focus, focus groups and interviews. Okay. So that's one of the things you can do. So focus focus groups can get you a lot of information real quick because you've got lots of people in one room all at one time. And it saves you having to go and ask each, each person an individual question. The problem with focus groups often is that, one, the experimenter or the UXer can be kind of guiding what's going on in the group, which isn't necessarily useful or helpful. The other problem with focus groups sometimes is that um, the person with the loudest voice or the most strong opinion wins. Okay? So if I'm really like, yes, I think it should be this, this is what I'm saying is right, then other people who've got good ideas might just stop talking. Okay, so you as a UXer need to look at that. What people aren't talking, why aren't they talking? Is it bored or is it the fact that they're not talking for a specific purpose because they're being shouted down? Because they feel their view isn't valid. The idea is to get all views, no matter how ridiculous they may seem. Okay? Just as we saw um, previously, some of the previous um, examples, the reason why people um, didn't, the thing that made people reduce their energy if, or increase their energy efficiency. Um, most wasn't information on energy, but it was information on what their neighbours were doing. And that was shouted down in the focus group that uh, looked at those questions. They just said, no, that's not going to happen. But it wasn't. that was the key factor. So nothing is out of bounds. Okay, so you learn by asking here, which, you know, sometimes is maybe not such good learning. You know, the problem here that we've got with this course is exactly this. You're learning by me talking to you. You're not learning by, if, it, if I am my way, this would be a second year course and we can all go and do um, examples classes in laboratories. But well, that's not the way it's going to work. So you're learning by me talking at you in some regard and reading. Which is a bit like this. You're not learning by doing, 
which is more effective in a lot of ways. Okay? But sometimes we don't have a choice. You know, what we'd like in a perfect world doesn't exist. Okay. Now, this is a good one. Um, social. So, the social stuff is very useful if you can possibly do it. You should never underestimate it. So all this means is that you go out with people and have some beers. You get a load of work people or a load of people or a load of users in a space where they've had a beer and they're all together, they'll start to tell you everything. Okay? All the good bits, all the bad bits, they'll be bitching, they'll be gossiping, they'll be everything else. But you can harvest this information yeah, from them. And that's a good thing because it means that you can actually be there and, and, and have some real conversation about what the problems are with the user experience of certain tools, certain techniques. Yeah. So it's kind of observation on a small scale, it's relaxed. There's no, you know, people need to know that you're there, and they need to know that you are going to be taking notes, that there is a purpose to this, because otherwise they might be saying things that they don't want to be, they, that they, that it's not ethical in general, if you're kind of taking lots of notes from people secretly, if they don't know that's what you're doing. But most people aren't that bothered if it's in an informal situation and they know that they're going to be anonymous, that they know you're not going to make any reference to anybody. It's just a group discussion. So these social aspects are quite good. Even if you decide not to write any of it up, just going to the pub with the, or going to some social event with people allows you to bond with those people, those people tell you things. You might not divulge any of those things, but it might inform how you create the next focus group, yeah, or the next interview. Okay. Okay, so lack of users. If we've got a lack of users, this is another useful technique that we can use. So we've got no use, it's very difficult to get users all the time to, for those users to be there and available and open and wanting to uh, answer your questions, because they've got jobs to do. But what you can do is understand, and they do this in archaeology, you understand people by the artifacts that they create, by the artifacts and the tools that they create. Okay? They do it in ecology for animals. You understand animals by the traits, by the tell signs, by the things that they leave behind. This is exactly this for artifacts. Okay? We're looking at the kinds of forms that are used, the kind of jargon on those forms that are used, the way that these tools are put together, the way that people have created maybe paper-based notes. So who, had, who, who here had a, a visit day interview when they first came all those years and years ago? Or who had a visit day interview? Okay, one or two, a few people. Did you have a visit day interview? You were lucky. God, oh dear. Uh, okay, so in that, in that interview, you will have gone on a tour of the area. You will have gone down to the Atlas room. Not the Atlas room, to the, um, to the Atlas uh, rooms down the bottom where there's a little uh, kind of histor historical museum. And on one of those work surfaces, you'll see that people have created sets of paper notes. Okay? To get them around the fact that the actual notes that they were given weren't suitable or useful. That's useful material. Because it says, one, the kind of training we're giving and the kind of, and the kind of notes and manuals we're giving aren't appropriate or aren't effective. And it also tells us that, hey, there's, a good, there's lots of information on this uh, sheet about what people find difficult and what they need a refresher in. So if you go down and look at that, you can see they're right there, because that's exactly how it was left when people walked away from it. Yeah? So these kind of things, these trace elements, are useful. Okay, now... I'm not going to quite get into this bit yet, but has anybody heard of unobtrusive observation? No. Okay, so unobtrusive observation relates back a bit to this archive stuff, and we're going to do this in a bit more detail in the end anyway in, our, in, a, in another lecture, but it's something that might be useful to go in here as well. So unobtrusive observation is really about um, trying to understand users by, but without, without intruding upon them. So the way that this is done, conventionally done in, say, social science and that kind of thing, is to um, look at any kind of thing that's left within the environment. So, for instance, people could tell how popular an exhibit at a, um, library, at a museum was, not by asking people questions, but by how frequently you have to change the floor tiles for the carpet. Carpet floor tiles. Increased wear equals increased use, equals more people standing around the exhibit, equals that's the most popular one. So, um, 
The same is true for, say, upstairs. In the toilets upstairs here, you've got a number of sinks. And one of those sinks is stained very dark brown. And the reason why it's stained very dark brown is because that's the one that everybody pours the coffee in. Okay? So that says to us, wouldn't it be useful if we didn't want to replace that sink every five minutes, and because we can't get the coffee stains off, we have some special bin that just says, put the coffee in here. Okay? That would be useful to say. This kind of unobtrusive observation can be applied um, in computer science, it's my opinion, and the opinion of a number of others. Okay. So this is something that you could think about when you're doing your work. Okay, so we've got onto this getting the information, but we now need to convey that information to software engineers. Or, if you're the software engineers in the system, you need to be able to take that information. So who's done um, things like user stories, case studies, those kind of things from software engineering. Okay, so some people, but we'll, we'll have a look in a little bit more detail. Okay, so here is a story card. Okay, you can see this on page 106. So this is a story card with notes. And so all this says is that what you have to do as user experience people <coughs> is, to, is to process this, all this requirement elicitation all this data you've acquired in the requirements elicitation phase, you have to process that down into something that you could, that's easily understandable by a user who is um, um, a software engineer who maybe isn't pricing, who hasn't got the time to analyse that data and maybe won't understand what it is. That's why it needs your expertise. Okay? You need to be experts to be able to do this. So, one way to convey information is to write these simple user stories, so sometimes we're going to call them scenarios, personas, user stories, case studies, okay, those kind of things. Um, the idea is to, to allow the software engineer or the technical developer to be placed in the situation or to empathise or to more understand the user and their needs. So it can go from being very unrich to be, to be very sparse, like this one is here, but can we can pay for the job most of the phone call. Okay? So that's just a piece of functional requirements in what's called a story card. And it's got with notes because it says here we're going to get an asset MasterCard, American Express, and we need to discover. Okay? Easy. That's, that's very simple. So you're able to say, well, actually, this is one of the functional requirements we've got. Now, here, too much detail. Okay? So a company can pay for job posting with a credit card, they say over hundred dollars, blah 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 blah. Okay. So this is really instructions. This isn't a, this has moved from being a story to being instructions about collecting the expiration of the date of the car. The system can store the card number for future use. All these things are more about um, not what needs to be done, but how it should be done, how the developer should do it. And that's not what we're trying to convey right now. Because it, maybe the developer knows better. It's not up to us, the user experience people, to decide how it's going to be coded, but it might be up to, it's up to the software engineer in some regard. Now this isn't a 100% thing, as with everything in the user experience. And the reason why it's not 100% is because, say for instance, scenarios might very well have this kind of information, or some of it anyway, to make the story richer, so that you can be in the place of that, of that person. So. A revised card might be that the company can pay for a job placement with a credit card. No, we will accept, will we accept the school card? So that's the only question you might have because you're going to presume you're accepting everything else. Um, note for the UI, don't have a field for card type. It can be um, derived from the first two digits of the card. So this is a bit of additional information which we think the software engineer might not have, but we do. So if there's something that you think the software engineer might not have that's beyond, if you like, the normal way that we would expect these things to work technically, we can actually create these. Uh, we can create a note that says, think about this. Okay? But it's not part of the direct story. Yeah? Okay, so for story cards, they're, they're pretty straightforward. And the only way you can really understand them is to go into a working environment and do them. Um, you can read as many books as you like, there's books in the background, there's no, there's no substitute for actually doing it. So, story cards, do you get a general idea of what these are about? They're sort of small snippets of stories, 
that a set of cards, a set of, a set of story cards, will build up into a larger story, a larger set of small snippets. And it will be the story of both the users and the expected interaction with the um, system. Okay, so I think this is reasonably straightforward. Do we all agree? Yeah? Nothing here to challenge in particular. Okay. Use cases. So use cases, as you can see here, see here, have a lot more data in them. Okay? And these use cases do talk to us a bit more about functionality. Yeah? Now it might be that we want to move a standard user story from being something which is very much about an analysis of user information to something that's more a specification for a use case. Okay? And we can see here that in these use cases we have things like triggers. We have things like preconditions and stakeholder interests. And we can see here, we've got stakeholders, this term we had previously, stakeholders, actors, roles, proxies, okay, from last week. So we can see that these things here, the scope, so you're scoping it, you're giving it context. So you can see that we're moving from something that was, that, that's a user story, that's very sort of um, discursive, if you like, in some ways, which just says what we want. Here, we've got a lot more information about how we want it to be. Now, it might be that we can't fill all this in as user experience people. We can, maybe we don't have all the information. Maybe this trigger part we maybe don't know so much, or the action, the descriptions of the actions we might know, not know completely. But we might. Okay? So this gives you a template that you could use, and you could use this template in business. You know, if you, if you went and made a template like this, this would be, you know, you'd be able to move this around most businesses. Um, that do this kind of work, and they'll be able to understand what you're trying to say. Okay? So, looking at this, the minimal guarantees, success, success guarantees, any questions about this, use cases? No. Straightforward. Yeah? Okay, so, here's a scenario, and this is a real scenario. So this is taken from the scenario from the website, but it's actually taken from... The user agent, work, the user agent, the World Wide Web, uh, WAI user agent accessibility guidelines, technical implementation report. Okay, just still in draft. Um, so this one here is a scenario about Mary. Okay, so it's trying to give you an idea about what Mary wants to do and what problems might occur if this success criteria in those guidelines aren't met. Okay, so that's what it's trying to give you. The scenario is, what will be the problems if this, if this success criteria isn't met? And the, and the reason why we're trying to do that is because we're trying to put knowledge that we have as experts in accessibility, in this case, into a format that's digestible and usable by people who may be not experts in that area. Okay. Now, does anybody know about HTML5? What about the What WG Working Group? Okay, no. So the What WG Working Group was a set of is a set of um, uh, companies that came together when um, the World Wide Web Consortium was looking at developing X HTML on its own, um, and they wanted something that was a bit more Java-like, a bit more um, functional, uh, a bit more programmable, and so they came up with this idea for HTML5, which then became so um, all-encompassing all that. The uh, W3C took on HTML5 and chucked out to the XHTML. Okay. But, in the um, But the point is that HTML, the definition and the specification of HTML, is created mostly by programmers, okay? led by um, Hixie, Ian Hickson from Google. Okay? So he's got this very definite view of things, and so have a lot of the coders that, uh, who were creating or putting into this specification of HTML5. Very difficult for them to sometimes understand the true problems that, that say, disabled users might have. It's, in, it's difficult sometimes to understand the problems that mobile users might have. So they're creating a specification based on, by its nature, some kind of, um, well, their own experiences. And those experiences might not be to do with, say, disability or mobility. And so therefore, these scenarios are useful to allow, to, put, to allow them to put themselves in the context of Mary in this case. So, Mary has a learning disability, she finds the images on web pages very distracting. So, would we, did we know that anyway? Did you guys know that people with learning difficulties, people with cognitive disability find 
lots of moving images quite distracting. More distracting than other people. Now, so now you do. By the scenario. Yeah? Yes, sir. Wouldn't the people with the learning disability uh, get more information from the images than actually reading the text? That's what you think, but no, the answer is not that. that. Simplistic text, spoken word, yes, but animated images, lots of different kinds of images, more difficult. Okay, because there's lots of different sensory input coming in. Okay, it's difficult to know where to section that input. Yeah? Okay. So we can see here that Mary would like a certain set of things to occur. This is because we already know that this is this is right, because we've actually spoken to people with cognitive disabilities, learning disabilities. Okay? There's a famous uh, quote in the accessibility and disability community, which is, nothing about us without us. Okay? And we'll be getting on to that. But this kind of stuff is because we because information, we already know certain information about different kinds of people, and we need to convey that information so that we don't get misunderstanding. Common sense says that yes, images would be better, but they aren't, because common sense is often not any kind of sense at all. Yeah? It's just an excuse for bigotry, mostly, etc. Yeah? Okay. So scenarios look pretty straightforward to me. You're creating a scenario that tries to put the software engineer in the context of that person based on your expert knowledge. Whether that person have a learning difficulty, or they be a um, sales executive at a large corporation. That's what you're trying to do. That's the point of the scenario. Is that kind of obvious? Is this coming across? We're okay with the scenarios. You could write a scenario in an exam if I gave you a success criteria for it, couldn't you? Oh, I'm sure you How long could the scenario have to be? Uh, just like Yeah, a paragraph. It needs to be digestible. People aren't going to read beyond the paragraph, just like most people don't look at, don't look at anything beyond the first page of Google results. Yeah? That's why. Okay, personas. Personas are very, very similar okay, to scenarios. But the difference with the persona is that you're trying to understand not just about what somebody needs to do as a task, but what they are as a person and what their general, more broad-term wants and needs are. What they, what, the, what they want to see in a more broader scale. And then scenarios are about take, picking out individual tasks um, from, say, task analysis that we talked about, or participant observation that we talked about, and modelling those. This, personas, is about the person, the rest about the scenario or the task that they're going to be doing. Okay? So that you can understand more about that. Why, are, so why do we even care about personas then? Why are these useful as opposed to scenarios? Yes. It's more background information. It's more background information, good. Yeah. Anything else more specific? Is it likely that I can write a scenario about every possible uh, task that might occur? Unlikely. For everybody. Unlikely. I might be writing scenarios about tasks that are most important or tasks that I know. If you've got a general understanding of the person, then you can, that gives you the information. You're able to then start to think, hmm, how would this person handle this then? How would this person handle this without an explicit scenario? Is the, defer def is the differentiation okay? Yes? Um, just to clarify, is the previous example a uh, scenario or a persona? Scenario. Okay, the, the only reason I'm pointing out is because I'm confused and then here it's just as a persona. Yeah, so there's a persona, the persona and the scenario are quite, quite related. As I've, as I've said, so you can see those in both different in different ways. But the difference is that the, this one here is about things like adding functionality would allow Mary to, to write it. So it's about the task model. Okay, whereas persona is more about the person. You can see this here. So this is persona on steroids. Okay, so this kind of thing is difficult. Well, you can't read it. Well, you could read it if you go online to the URL that's in the notes. Okay. So here, we've got a bit more information about that person. So we can see that we've got a picture to allow us to empathise, to understand who that person is better. Okay, bizarrely. We've got the various details about who she is, about this. This is her quote, this is what her major, major goal is. This thing here is extra bits and pieces about uh, a description about the background, about who she is and what she wants. 
And here we've got various things like goals that she's got. This thing here just allows, is really just allowed to allow us to rate or to see how important various aspects of the goals are. Okay, so what should, this might indicate what should be developed first, or what can be left for version two, kind of. Okay? So this is a kind of persona that goes from very small bits of text, sometimes combined with scenarios, to this kind of thing, where we've got <coughs> actual cards with people and information about that people, about those people on them. Now, there's an entire database to do with lung cancer patients and lung cancer carers and lung can and families who have uh, cancer um, to allow people to understand more about the needs of the people from actual people, from real people. So this, when you see that as a as persona, when you look at those as personas and scenarios, they're taken from long longitudinal interviews. And there's lots of information in there because it's a complicated subject for each individual. Okay. And it's a sensitive subject for each individual. I'm telling you these things not because I... Well, I'm telling you these things because I don't think you're going to be just sat in a company banging out code every day or doing UX. You're at the University of Manchester. You're often going to be doing something much, well, different to what you expect, I hope. Challenging, I hope. Yeah? So that's the kind of reason why we're talking about things like, say, lung cancer care. Yeah? Because you, be, you might be asked to be doing this, to be creating this, to be talking to people about this. Yeah? Okay. Any more questions about personas, scenarios, or personas on steroids? Yes? Uh, with the personas, so typically, how many would you look at? Because aren't you in danger? of being too focused on one individual and losing general usability and accessibility. Ah, yes, in some ways that's the case, but what we do normally is that you have your, um, you have a load of personas, sorry, a load of interviews with, say, focus groups or um, case, case studies with people, individuals. Yeah. So, you've got, so you've either got a focus group or you've got lots of different individual interviews or questions, that kind of thing. That's the data elicitation. You analyse that data to try and aggregate it in some way. And then you place that aggregated data as the persona or scenario. So in reality, there is nobody called Becky Gordonmore. Oh, I see. Right. I just, you know, it's, just, it's just nothing. She's just some random... That, that person, the big <coughs> person isn't Becky Gordonmore. She's off some stock photo. Yeah? Um, there is no Eva. There is no Mary. Yeah? These are composites. So, in a focus group, Becky Broadmore might be focus group might be the results of focus group one. Yeah. Or she might, or there might be a couple of these kind of personas on steroids from two different opposing ideas from focus group one, or the aggregated amounts. Yes. So, if they're made up, <coughs> if they're made up, what's the value in specifying the frequency of how often Eva visits at random? Like, what's what's the value in that? So the value of this one. Yeah. She, so Eva was diagnosed with lung cancer eight months ago. Okay. She has a, a management symptom. Hopefully, it sounds like she found a treatment. Where does it say a bit where she? Oh, the mm -hmm. doctor lives nearby, and she sees her grandchildren often. Think of the reason. But it's made up, like. What? Yeah, but think of the reason. It's not made up. It's. A, I mean, it's a composite. So it's made up, but it kind of isn't made up because this comes from real people. So why might why why? Would I tell you that she visits her grandchildren and she's uh, 75? Yes? It's an indication of the quality of life, how happy she is. I mean, if she sees her family and her grandchildren often, that's going to be a reason that she's going to be happier in her own life, so she's not going to be miserable or depressed. That's one reason. Another th reason about contact with people who are, who are younger people, say in this case. Any ideas? I'm trying to like Okay, family, yes? Uh, you have people more likely to be in you know, how to use technology, uh, so obviously right. people she's exposed to. Yes, most people, uh, most people will certainly, uh, that will be found with these uh, lung cancer studies, is that if they're older, they don't use technology. So therefore, the, light, the, less, the closer they are to having contact with grandkids or their own children, the more likely they are to be able to get information from those sources and not sources that we have. Okay, so rather than specify, like, making some petty specific detail about frequency of this fictional character either. Yeah. Couldn't you just say that it's a, it's a common characteristic of our users that they have access to young people? 
like they, they, they're frequently in contact well, with Well, it's a common characteristic that if you have access to young people, you're more likely to be able to elicit information that you're not looking for from the net. And it's a characteristic of people who don't have access to younger people that they won't get information from the net and they might use other kinds of sources. And those things would be often specified in things like a scenario, how do I look for information, and that may be a persona on steroids, but in the context of the persona itself, because it's about giving you a more broad generalization, then that, that might not be appropriate. Because if I tell you that, then you're now only thinking about what I've just said. But what happens if there are other things that you come across in your development where it might be useful to know that, oh, younger people are in this profile too. Regular contact with younger people are in this profile too. How can I dovetail my work into those younger people, which then goes around to the uh, older person, say? Right, so as a software engineer, I find it tedious that I have to sort of Scroll through a big paragraph like this to try and pick out that little detail without a characteristic that is. Even if you could just be told as a software engineer, it's a common characteristic that that happens. Yeah, but don't work. That's why I've got shit software. Don't work. You know, unless it's that person, I can just give you it, bam, 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 done. Yeah, because that's how we're, our brains think, maybe, as software engineers. We want the data, we want the info. Yeah, we want it quick, and we want it now, we want to go on with it, but it doesn't work. So, you know, lots of the stuff. Lots of the stuff, like this, you know, is so that the idea is that you're going to read this as a software engineer, and you might think, Jesus, this is tedious. But you know, you've got half a day off from banging out code, so you know it's a break. And uh, you read, you read this, and you think, oh yeah. But then you might not think anything more about it. But because you are a software engineer, because you have got a memory and you know you're brain, you might think in the future, what was that thing I read about that grandchild? Oh, we could use the grandkids. That's the idea in mean, these broad ones scenarios. This is why these things are small, specifically for that, but it's mostly functional, yeah? Because bam, give it to them. Well then, it's, it's, there's, a more, there's a number of different ways we want things to happen. Here, you might disagree with my trigger terms if you need a software engineer if I wrote them in there, yeah? Here, it's so that you can, in this persona, it's so that you can get a more broad overview. Now, you might find it tedious to, to do it. God, you're taking this course, I really hope you don't. But if, if you do find it tedious, then... That's unfortunately, that's unfortunately a problem. It's trying to give you, it's trying to put you in that person's position, such that it becomes more, it becomes less functional and one line fragmented, A, B, C, mathematical, and to be a bit more rich because that's what we are as people. That's the idea. Yeah. Yes. Um, I guess maybe to some extent, um, it makes it by making it slightly more relational to the actual the person. Or maybe you can kind of, um, oh God, I'm black. Um, basically, I, I guess the difference between this and having it listed out as functional reasons is the fact that in this case, you're more like people tend to be more empathetic towards a uh, kind of a person. So if if we're following kind of a storyline um, or a situation, we're more kind of involved in what's happening as opposed to right. This is what I need to achieve. Kind of thing. Take it off the list. I've yeah. done that, I've done that, I've done that. Because then you don't focus on the things around it that yeah. kind of affect the way that is achieved. So that's true, but also there is a balance to be um, to be had. Not can right in the fact that um, the balance is that in some software scenarios you need to get this banged out quick because your bosses aren't going to bother about all this stuff. The point is though, it'll cost them more money in the end because they're going to have to make the changes. In the end, they'll have to, you know, but. As um, Fred Brooks, who knows Fred Brooks? Fred Brooks? Mythical Man Month? 360, IBM 360? Jesus. Oh, I'm very. Anyway, Fred Brooks, Mythical Man Month, IBM 360, you know? Massive man in the field of computer science. So, one of his quotes is You will always make a pilot, you will always make a prototype. Even if you don't intend to, you will make a prototype. Okay? And that's exactly this. You do it wrong, you're going to make a prototype. It's just going to be a production prototype which you're going to have to trash. Okay? And write the real version. You're going to do it. Okay. Any more personas on sale? Any more about personas scenarios? Yes? Uh, questions regarding classification of uh, activity of a group study. So if we building a large system uh, which is intended for the broader users and how many different classifications we will make for personas as the young people using it or you know working class people using it or sort of elderly using something. 
or when it's narrow focused on just the health related software we're designing? How many classifications we, we ought to make? That's, that's entirely based on the experience of the project. There's nothing that I can't take, tell you that now. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that we'll be coming up to a set of principles in a moment, design principles that go on for the next eight lectures and uh, four weeks, about the kinds of things that you should be thinking about when you're actually building these systems to make them flexible and customizable and these kind of things. The point is, with lots of software now, especially with where the lots of systems, they exhibit an emergent behavior that we don't intend. So it's unintended often. So therefore, we can design it for one thing, but the emergent behavior of people just wanting to use it because we haven't thought about that occurs. So it's difficult to say in that context. We'll, give it, we'll look at some design stuff. Then only, the only thing we can do is think about the kinds of users that might want to use it based on your knowledge of the user groups at the time. So if it's a company that's, that shares a certain vocabulary, you need to dovetail into that vocabulary, not, and so that might only be a few scenarios, because people already, you know, if you've got developers on site, they might already know the, the uh, organisational ethos, you know, but under jargon. Or you might need more to convey that jargon and what it means. It just depends on that particular situation. That's why it's difficult. And that's what I'm trying to give you, these kind of tools that you can research more, because when you get into the real situation, you're going to have to do it individually for that one. It's individual every time. It's never by the numbers. You know, I wish it had Okay, wireframes. These are very easy to do, as you might see. A child could do this, a very badly drawing child, possibly like me or any other kind of software engineer, so user experience person could draw these kind of things. All these, all these are here to do is to give you some kind of drawn template that you can take to a focus group or you can take to an interview and say, let's draw this thing together. Let's draw a wireframe, which is what this is, together. Yeah? Let's see what kind of functionality we want on the screen. Why would I use this kind of stuff as opposed to a nice spanky prototyping uh, tool on a computer? Yes? Because when you take uh, this software to show users to, to play with, they're not very forthcoming about criticising it, but if you just take a piece of paper and a pen, they will quite happily tear it apart, literally. That's a good one, yes? Yeah. Also, it uses medium that they can manipulate themselves, like a pen and a paper, which they can use to draw on themselves. Yeah, good one. Sorry, you. I was going to yeah, say, hey, what do you use a pen? Yes, good. Yeah. L lower uh, costs beforehand. Lower cost beforehand. So all of those are the right answer. Okay, low cost beforehand. Anybody can use a pen. You know, people aren't going to criticise stuff on, on a machine. And they also, they, they, don't, they won't be getting near the machine because they're scared of breaking the software. They're scared of it going pear-shaped. Whereas... If they you say start to draw this or we draw it together, it's very easy. There's no barrier to it. Yeah? So even though it looks basic, because it is basic, that's, this is often the best way to do it because it doesn't put a barrier between you and the other people. You are doing the translation. It might be up to you to then bang this into make this a rapid prototype. Yeah? Build this as a rapid prototype in the end so we can see it really functioning. Yeah? Okay, now we've got a mock-up. Stroke Wizard of Oz. Now this has been actually created by graphic designers. Okay, so it looks um, super cool. Kind of cool. Um, okay, so this is a mock iPhone application, and it's um, it's it allows you to see this kind of uh, various um, uh, the various ways that the the application would look, so you can explain it in better detail. So you might move from a wireframe to this kind of nice thing. Now the Wizard of Oz thing. Who knows what a Wizard of Oz is? One, two, i.e., do you know what it is in the context of user experience, or do you know what it is as part of the film where we skip down the other big road? <laughs> it's, a, it's all nice and flashy, it doesn't actually do anything. Right, or it's nice and flashy, but it doesn't actually do anything. What's the other thing that it might be? Is it only using the car, uh, like cardboard cutouts and like moving things around and interacting with it? Basically. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing anymore. Think of it, as it who's seen those devices? Surely everybody must have seen it at Christmas, or if you're in bed sick and there's nothing else on, it's the Wizard of Oz and you've got to watch it just for the guy who up as a lion. Surely. <laughs> okay, so at the very end of the Wizard of Oz, what do they find out that this, is, that this wizardry is all about? It's a little tiny guy behind a curtain manipulating everything, manipulating these robots and things with some strings, yeah? Or whatever. So that's, that's what this is. You, a person, you can even have this as an electronic film. So it's generally. Uh, a web page, or it might be an application, and when somebody types something in, 
There's no functionality, there's just a person sat somewhere going, we type that in, make a change. Yeah? Do that. That's the wizard of Oz thing. So it means that you don't have to add program logic. You don't have to add any kind of logical elements. All you have to add, it, all you have to add is the user interface to manipulate it because it cuts down in cost. Now, we use this very successfully in some experiments here whereby we wanted to actually see how people use mobile devices moving around this building, actually, and outside the building. So the way to do it is to get them to type stuff. But we want to get them to type stuff at certain points, like when they're going downstairs. The only way to do that is to pretend there was a, um, that, that when they submitted something, submitted a comment on their mobile device that was on a, uh, on a website, we would expect for confirmation and then some more text to be displayed or another form to be displayed, just like this is. But what happened is we didn't, we just, we were the ones doing the submitting. So we waited for them, because there's, there's a delay in here, obviously, until they get to the stairs and they're about to fall down, and then we go, yeah, try and do that and go downstairs. So then we deliver to them the, uh, the, the form we want them to fill in, exactly at the point where they're on the stairs. Okay, to see what happens. Luckily not, but we did have a number of people, you know, sort of making sure that they would catch them. But yeah, uh, it, it, worked, it worked very well. Okay, we, we learnt a lot. Um, I haven't got a lot of papers, which, you know, there we go. Okay, so this is this kind of Wizard of Oz stuff. Storyboarding. So we all, are we familiar with storyboarding? Anybody who's done film and all that kind of stuff, storyboarding, okay? So, generally what we're trying to do here is have a storyboard of what would happen. So this is kind of a, of a, um, you can think of it in some ways as, as sort of the, um, Use cases, or in some cases, user um, uh, user stories smushed together with some, some kind of bizarre wizard of Oz thing going on. Because what you're trying to do is say, what would be, what would happen if a user started to use a system, they they changed this particular functionality. What would happen next? What would happen next? What would happen next on these choices? Okay, that's what the story is. The story of the interaction. The story of the task. Yeah. Very, very, very simple to do, very simple to get wrong, okay? Very simple to miss stuff out. All of this is very simple to miss stuff out. That's why you need to keep going back to the users. It's very simple to just get into, get, you, get stuff into your mindset and then you miss stuff. Okay. Are we okay with storyboarding? Flowcharts. If you don't have to use flowcharts now, then I suggest you give up. The reality is, Loads of use flow charts. Nobody, nobody, very few. Very few people use them formally anymore. But what you will find is millions, millions of scraps of paper floating around research offices, skunk works with bubbles and arcs and squares and stuff just drawn on it and some bizarre scribble that nobody understands what it is. You'll see these on post-its, you'll see them on the back of a beer, uh, you know, a, a beer um, coasters, these kind of things. Scraps of paper. They're kind of flame charts, yeah, this does this, and then we go here, oh, we can do that there. That's, the, that's really the kind of level of flow charts we're at now. We don't have this formal thing so much. Sometimes we do for sort of state transition diagrams where we're looking for more, um, a, a more formal representation of stuff. But flow charts directly, not really. Okay, not so much. Certainly, the top of the Tantin formal. Okay, so state transition diagrams and state machines. So, I expect that most of you will have been taught how to do these in your software engineering careers to a profession. Yeah? Okay, we're not going to get onto them uh, in any detail here. But they do exist, you might, you might need to create these, so there's uh, books and uh, resources you can look at, conscious of the time. Um, but we don't need to worry about these right now. Okay. Is everybody happy with state machines and state transition diagrams and all that rubbish? Yeah? Okay. Okay, you are now, oh dear, you are now. <laughs> so we've gone to the super formal. Okay, so we're now at UML stage. So we've all been taught UML as well, we've all been, we're all used to doing UML. In our second year software engineering, we need UML up the machine there, I'm sure. Robert, UML-tastic, yeah? Okay. Okay, no pop quiz, no questions, go for coffee. We'll be back at uh, 12, then we'll be starting.